Now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dan Nelson. And uh, I've known Dan for maybe around 20 years, not that long. And uh, when I first got my first computer, and uh, <laughs> he helped, helped me set it up. And, and since then, I've had two or three uh, computers. And um, any time I've had anything wrong, I always call him down when he comes and helps. And I've also taken a computer course with him, a night school course was about <coughs> six weeks long. And um, so through it all, I feel I've got to know him a little bit and uh, got to know a few personal things about his life that some good and uh, some not so good in his life. <laughs> and through it all, I've been very impressed with his calm nature that rides through any any storm that has happened in his life. But he he seems to go with it. And um, also, I remember one time he came to my house and he was in the middle of working and I got a knock on the door from the neighbor and she said, your car is running down the street by itself. <laughs> <laughs> and my street in front of my house has sloped a little bit and uh, Dan ran out, sure enough, there's car was going all the way down past Gordon Road and stopped when it hit a house. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, I feel that was something that was really <laughs> the, uh, catastrophe. <laughs> But he, he was calm through it all. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, he had a new, brand new yellow vehicle that made better than the one he had before. Much better. Yeah. <laughs> so today we're very happy to have Dan. And um, he is, I feel he's well qualified to speak on this topic today, which is from purgatory to peace, Dan. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, can everybody hear me? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's Hopefully. great. Yeah, so this is, yeah, it's actually appropriate for this topic um, because it seems like everything that happens in life has a reason for it. And uh, depending on if we're on the side of fear or on the side of love, we can interpret it any way we want. So with that vehicle, it was like, there was a lot of good things that came out of that. And I could have been resisting it and like been mad and like, why is the universe conspiring against me? You know, you could easily take that approach, right? Like what's going on? How come everything's against me? And that's like the conspiratorial uh, side or whatever. But the other side is like, Clearly, there's some big events that are conspiring to bring something better to my attention. And in my life, that's always been the case. Um, when I can step back and not judge it, I realize there's like a higher order that's trying to reveal something that I can learn from. And in the case with the vehicle, uh, I was so lucky because the vehicle, the parking brake dislodged and um, it slid along a bunch of yards and hit a compost, hit some garbages, um, hit a, whole, a, a sign, and all these things slowed it down. And then it went through a trampoline at the very bottom of Gordon Road. And then it stopped right as it hit a house. Like, it just broke the trim. So it wasn't, it wasn't even that bad of a damage. So. I was, I was really grateful for that because that's really scary when your car is running on its own. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But that was great because actually that car, um, I needed to get rid of it and I got the best car I've ever had. So I'm really happy. It's a nice yellow, some people call it the yellow submarine. But uh, that's, that's a conspiracy right there, a conspiracy of love or something better. That's a car that's ahead of its time because they're making cars that are all going to do that. Yeah. Well, that's right. That's right. My, that's, that's a good point. My car was ahead. Like, it was like a self-driving vehicle before they were even on the road. That's right. Good karma. Yeah, exactly. Very good karma. I got good karma. That's right. <laughs> so I, I figure I, w I had this dream and I was like, helping these people come out of this hell realm and I didn't seem to be affected by the hell like so I went to this dark part of town where these uh, Illuminati had created this dark grid of energy to try and control people's minds and suck them into this vampire like consciousness and I remember going to that part of the city in my dream and I, I was like realizing I gotta help this one particular guy I was like I gotta help you out of here because this isn't good for you <laughs> And I ended up bringing him to this party uh, on another side, another part of town where I was telling everybody that the real conspiracy is love. Like, and here's all the evidence for it. So there's evidence everywhere. And I, I think that's the idea of, of my talk. It's like, let's talk about this. So I put together a slideshow that goes through some ideas that we can explore together. And so, I don't know, can you guys, you guys can see that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. My projector is getting very, very old, and so it's faded over the years. So I'm glad we can still see it here. So, interesting question is like, how did we end up in this situation? How do we get here? Why do we appear separate? What's going on, right? So it's a really good question. And I know people that come into this world, when they're young, they question this more. Sometimes when people get older, they stop questioning and they start becoming kind of more patterned and routine like robots. Not everybody, but I think that happens to all of us where we get inside of a routine. So sometimes it's good to ask the question, how do we get here? And one of the things we have are, are the creation myth stories. So is it- That's hard to read. Can't see it, no. Okay. Well, I'll, if you can't see it, that's, that's too bad. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I can make it in writer. So, um, yeah. Well, you know, one day we'll have a good projector and it'll be really bright. You can read it for us. So I'll read it for you. So yeah. we can start with the creation myth. So a lot of different cultures had what was called the creation story or the creation myth. And one of the creation myths is the one that I remember when I was a teenager reading. It was a native creation story. And it said that we were all one. With, with God, or we were all one knowing, one universal, unconditional love, harmonized union. And somehow, we questioned that, or we stepped outside of it. And in stepping outside of it, we became, in a sense, our own creators, our own gods, but we couldn't handle the light. So we ended up in, somehow imprisoning ourselves. So I'm, I'm sort of like paraphrasing. We ended up imprisoning, our, imprisoning ourselves and in order to heal from this dark rift that got created by separating from God, we decided to incarnate and completely forget what happened so that we could individuate from the beginning and move, our, move upwards to God from the, from the beginning of complete forgetting. So that's one creation myth. And all these are metaphors, really. And I'm sure we all have, we've heard of different creation myth stories. One of the modern creation myth stories that we have is the Big Bang. So the Big Bang is, I think, is a really good metaphor. So it's it's like everything was one, maybe that's one idea, and then it, then there was this huge explosion, and then it broke itself into little parts everywhere. And as different theories say, all those parts are coming back together. The universe is contracting. However. Uh, right now, in quantum physics, people are saying the universe is expanding, and some people are saying the universe is contracting. So it's, you can really cherry pick your information, and um, it's such a paradox. Like, how could something explode out of nothing? It's a very curious story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like a religion. Like, if you're an objective scientist, 
and you like, I believe in the complete mechanical universe and everything's, everything's objective, and that everything in this reality and everything to do with consciousness is constructed in my brain. So you could, you could think that, but then you have to go along with that whole uh, dogma that everything came from a big bang, but then you, the dogma doesn't make sense. Like how could everything come from nothing? That's quite metaphysical for someone who calls himself an atheist. So that's quite an interesting story in itself. Um, one of the things that I've come across, and especially with Course in Miracles, is the idea the world isn't real. So the world meaning the one that we see in front of us, the one that has duality, cause and effect, the one that has death. And um, so that's, that's an interesting idea. And it, it makes sense because <coughs> how could anything that dies be ultimately real? How could anything that's temporal or dualistic or opposite have any you know, everlasting eternal truth to it? It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so different spiritual traditions have talked about the world as Maya. Like in Buddhism, um, I believe it's, they, it's called Maya. The world is Maya illusion. So in Buddhism, one of the quotes I found was, uh, Buddh I'll just tell you about Buddhism, Taoism, Taoism, Christianity, Course in Miracles, and a couple other people, what their view is, was on the world. So in Buddhism, I got this quote, uh, the awakening is a return to the unconditioned consciousness from which all things emerge. And maybe that will get brighter. Maybe I can lower it. it just came yep. Yeah, lower it. Does that work better? It's a little better. It's a little sharper. <laughs> okay, it's sharper. That's good. Um, so in Taoism, awakening is discovering the way. The way, right? Is there another word for that? Tao. The Tao. The, the Tao. Tao, the way, right? Uh, which is the reality beyond human perception. So it's the reality beyond duality. It's, And so... Everything in this world is dualistic, so therefore it's beyond that dualism. And in Christianity, I found a couple of really interesting uh, verses here. There's in John, it says, believing is seeing, but seeing is not believing. So when you see, what you're seeing is what you're believing. And this is also in the Gospel of Thomas, there's a lot about how we're only seeing our projections. And there's quite a few lines about projection, which is very interesting. And the Thomas Gospel is the one that was left out, I believe, the King James. There's a few that were left out. So that was the one I, I like the most because it says the kingdom is within you. Uh, and I like that as well. So the idea of me going through all these different uh, points is that we're going to go in to see how is it possible that you could be in a purgatory reality if we're the ones that are creating the reality. So it's it really it's coming down to our choice whether we want to be in fear or in, in love. So it comes down to our choice. Now, in A Course in Miracles, and I think I, maybe this is verbatim or I paraphrased it, the world you see is an illusion of a world. God did not create it. For what he creates must be eternal as himself. Yet there is nothing in the world you see that will not endure. Yet there is nothing in the world you see that will endure forever. Some things will last time, last in time a little, while, while longer than others. But, in, but the time will come when all things visible will have to end, or will have an end. So I find you're familiar with that. Um, and Edwin Hubble, there was this quote of Edwin Hubble saying, from what he learned about quantum mechanics, he realized that when, he's, when you're putting a telescope, like the Hubble telescope, into a different part of the universe that nobody's ever looked, he believed there was nothing actually there. And the mere act of looking at a different part of the galaxy created it to collapse into something. On so, so on some level, we're seeing our own mind, our own collective mind. So there's a lot of physics that we can look at, the experiments in physics that prove that show us beyond any reasonable doubt that consciousness is the primary field. It's when things collapse into a physical reality is that 
um, it, it, they're not real until they collapse, until we look. So the act of looking collapses reality into something solid. So Edwin Hubble had a quote like that. David Bohm, if you've heard of David Bohm, he talks about the implicate and explicate order. And that having a lot to do with our consciousness or what our unconscious beliefs are. And then, of course, Carl Jung, he observed the, what he called the science of synchronicity, where um, our unconscious mind is orchestrating things in the outside world uh, to bring certain things to our attention. So ultimately, he, near his deathbed, he was saying more and more that even everything in the physical universe is part of the collective unconscious. It's not real. It's not ultimately real. It's part of an unconscious collective agreement from a long time ago, which is very interesting. So all these are saying, hey, the world, the world isn't real. So <laughs> what, do you, what do you guys think about that idea? It's all it's all a construct. We construct it. We put it on this and we put it on that. And it's just a construct. And if we can clear ourselves enough to feel that, yes. we're not quite as uh, willing to be so judgmental. Right, right. We're not, we're not so bound or imprisoned by something that's merely a construct. So it's not ultimately real in itself. So we can step back and be phenomenological. We could be, oh, it's very interesting. When we see something and we react to it, and we have an emotional reaction, especially when we have an emotional reaction, we're realizing that we're complicit in creating that on some level. So once we short circuit that emotional uh, cycle, we can, we can be phenomenological and say that, oh, that's very interesting, look what happened. You know, this, there was a car accident, or this event happened, or that person got mad or angry at me, or whatever, there was a crime. So if we're emotional, we react and we collapse time and we collapse it into something that seems bad or, or uh, negative or we judge, we judge it and solidify it. But when we let go, it can release and it can transform into something completely different. And that's, that's the beauty. That's, I think that's the whole beauty of it. What I would like to get at about moving from purgatory to peace is that give it a bit of space maybe have a little conspiracy of your own and, and as John said conspiracy I believe you said conspiracies also means a, a joined breath so if we have like a collective breath and just stop completely and then breathe and let it go and you'll notice that the outside world events will transform into something different and they don't have to be negative or they don't even have to have an emotional charge to them in fact, when we learn how to have that conspiracy and have that breath, we can allow for a higher dimension to come through it and give that thing that happened a much higher meaning. The, a more, so if we're neutral, we have nature conspire, as Carl Jung called it, a causal connecting principle is trying to conspire us to wake up to a much, a much higher reality, something more beautiful than what we originally judged it for. Yeah, would you yeah. say that it's my response to it? Like, so the car accident might right. still happen, but my response will be I'm coming from a place of peace. Right. And I bring that. Yes. To yes. The so, so that's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, the way we respond to a situation is determined by our own emotions, our own interpretations. Now that those car accidents may still happen, and uh, or maybe I got hurt, and. Um, if I'm not emotionally reacting to that pain, it doesn't mean that I didn't cut myself. Or um, so that car accident, you can change your view on it so that it's no longer something emotional. If you catch yourself quick, it, it may not have to continue into something that's uh, devastating. So I'm also saying that if we short circuit an event, by not reacting to it emotionally, we can steer that orchestration or that symphony into a different, into a different way. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like oh, you okay, you, you've got a question first? Just super quick, so say, um, say something happens, say for example, say somebody's really angry at you, and before you can even think, yes. 
So someone's angry at you, and before you can even think, your stomach's already in a knot, and right. you're responding. Right. Can you? Can, does it still work? So you're, you're immediately making it worse because you didn't catch it quick enough. Yes. Right. But like, say a minute goes by, and you go, "Oh yeah, right," and you start breathing, and yes. you start backing out of that, and yes. changing it. Can it still work? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, absolutely. That's a good question. Um, when a series of events have transpired. Um, you can judge them and you could say, okay, well, those experiences, I had this bad experience with this person or now I have a rift with this person. But yes, you can step back in that moment and give it inf infinite space and love and you'll notice that that short circuits, that negative karmic energy or that, that psychic energy that is negative will be released. And as we learn in constellation work, that's what happens. Yeah. I just wanted to add um, the phrase holding space because that's what you're talking about. If we can hold space for something, which is allowing a space for it, it to unfold without our conscious um, projection onto it. So holding space for someone else, holding space for ourselves, for the situation, giving space to um, allow it to be what it is rather than deciding yes. or projecting yes. what we interpret it to be. Amazing. Yes, and that makes a big difference if somebody's going through a crisis or an emergency of some kind, a spiritual emergency. Maybe somebody's taking too much, too many, too much drugs, or who knows what the scenario is. But they need help. They don't need you to react and put cuffs on them or something like that, which often happens, where we react with fear. But if we give space, and then we're actually giving a point of listening. So that, that if we give space, that person could feel like they've been heard, which makes all the difference in the world to, to how you're going to react to that scenario. Yeah. Um, I was just going to help and put it in a, another language. Um, because everything you're saying, uh, you know, is true from a Tibetan Buddhist perspective. Um, it, it's the I. Yeah. It's the I that... Uh, is a certain consciousness that we could get beyond. So then our spontaneous reaction is coming from the place that you're talking about. Like even my talking to myself, I get out of the way, is got everything it's to do with I. Yes. So it actually is hard work. Right. I mean, much harder than talking to yourself, I think. And, yes. Uh, and just the practice. But, um, it's true. I mean, it, I, ego and I is negotiating everything for the sake of ego I. Right. So just to be able. So to transcending see, the personal ego to to allow for a higher, higher. Perception. Well, the practice of meditation is. I mean, we say being in the present moment, or you know, there's just lots and lots of names. It's way harder than it. It sounds, <laughs> um, but it, that's why we call it a practice. But at least it's massaging. It's massaging the view that you're talking about. Yes. It is not, we are in the way, it's I is in the way. I is always trying to yes. make it work for yes, I. Yes, the little I. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. In, in, in the, something like injury, someone falls down the stairs and they really hurt themselves. If they and all the people around them Yes. Decide there are no broken bones. Yes. And that they're going to be fine by tomorrow. Yes. That can happen. Yes, but absolutely. When, but if everyone decides this is major, or it's impossible, or yeah, it's yes. impossible. Yes. It doesn't happen. It, exactly, and so that's a very perfect example of spontaneous remissions and healing, and uh, we even see this in certain tribes who have instantaneous healing. They can put a knife into themselves, and then they have spontaneous healing. So there, the people or the beings and the consciousness that's there has to allow for that as a possibility, truly. And so there are examples of these spontaneous healings that you're talking about. So it's also good to give that I've space. I've seen many of them. Maybe. I have too. And, and absolutely, you're absolutely right. And so it's really important to give space to that potential. And usually it's impossible for people, most people, yes. to believe that they're not badly injured, that this can act. That's right. And it's that belief that holds it into how long it's going to take, how many, that how long you have to wear a cast. Always. Yes. But without that belief, everything. Right, but not everybody, of course, that makes, it's true, and not everybody's meant to be there or is there yeah. or needs to be there. 
Um, it's all part of a process. Like some people need to go through those stages of that healing because that has a spiritual benefit more than the spontaneous healing does. No, they both can have a benefit. Yes, exactly. Depending on who so it just shows you, yes, that's possible, absolutely, and that's all. That's all part of this. It's just nice for us to know that possibility. It's, it's important for us to remember that possibility. Yeah. True. Thank you for saying that. Yes. Um, now, one of the things I want to talk about is the purely physical level, the quantum mechanical level or the psychological level. Now, as if we needed proof, it's kind of a funny thing trying to prove to somebody that consciousness creates reality or that consciousness is the primary field of creation. Um, it's fun to look for proof. Now, because we're, most of us, I believe, are scientific minded, we're gonna be affected by this whole idea of a mechanical universe and needing to find objective proof. I think a lot of us are still part of that matrix so it is good to offer that part of our minds some remedy in the sense of looking at quantum mechanics and showing, it, showing us how even every field that we study will bring us back to our power, which is that consciousness is the primary field of creation, which means that if we take responsibility for ourselves as a complicit part of the universe, then uh, we, can't, we can't ignore, we can't get away with being the victim. So the victim is a way of holding ourselves into a purgatory realm. And so I'm going to talk about a couple of things here, if we have time. I'll just go through them quickly. One of the things I want to talk about is the observer effect. So the observer effect is one of the best uh, scientific experiments that shows us that reality or particles or subatomic particles behave a certain way when we look at them and then behave a different way when they're not looking at them. So when we're not looking, if we look at the exact example here, when we're not looking at a particle, it acts as a wave. And in fact, in a lot of cases, it doesn't even exist. And a lot of uh, Bell and Bohm and many, many, have, many people have said that, in fact, electrons are only probability waves. They're not real. They're, they only they're in a state of superposition, which means they're everywhere at once, they're in many worlds, and it's not until a conscious observer looks at the subatomic particle does it collapse into something. And in the example of the double slit experiment, it's perfect because light behaves like a wave, or electrons behave as a wave, but when you go in and see why, why are they looking like a wave, I don't have to go into the double slit, but there's two slits, light goes through, it creates an interference pattern showing that it's a wave, but the moment you go and look at it, it, it there's no longer an interference pattern. It's only, it's only a particle that you start seeing, single particles, and it shows us that reality acts a certain way when we're not observing, so it's infinite potential. But when we look, we collapse reality, called the collapse of the wave, into a particle. So this is just a, a metaphor. Now, people who are hardcore skeptics, as they call themselves, would say, oh, there's something wrong with that experiment. There's obviously something wrong with the measuring device that's screwing it up, right? But so they had to come up with another experiment called the delayed choice quantum eraser to absolutely finalize that, in fact, yes, reality acts a certain way. It's in a state of many potentials until we look at it. So that, when we look at that, when we look at physics, there's so many other physics experiments that show us that, yes, reality is mutable, it's plastic, it's doesn't, it doesn't collapse until we project. So in other words, our projection is making manifest the reality we see. And we're only talking about quantum, like subatomic particles, but you can move all the way up to macromolecules and see our effect on that. And that's when you get into, that's when you get into uh, biology. Now, there's a couple of quotes here that are pretty interesting. Uh, as Warner Heisenberg said, uh, the atoms or elementary particles themselves are not real. They form a world of potentialities or possibilities rather than one of things or facts. And there was another famous uh, scientist who said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics and haven't been profoundly shaken, then you haven't understood quantum mechanics. <laughs> because so how, it's just so how weird. How old is this quote? That's, uh, that, that, that's a good question. Probably from the late 30s. Because in the 30s is when a lot of these experiments were done. Right. Like the EPR, uh, Einstein-Podelsky-Rosen effect showing that we have quantum inseparability. In other words, all particles are in instantly interconnected with every other particle. 
And so people like the military have, uh, maybe they already got, already got this figured out, but a way to have instantaneous communication. So there's like six or seven different ways that light can move faster than the speed of light. Everybody's thinking speed of light is a limit. It's not. Because you're thinking in three dimensions, you have to think in a higher dimension. But higher dimensional physics gets very interesting. We're not even going to go into that. <laughs> Let's talk about it. I, I'm going to bring up something that yes. for me is a connection. With okay, great. Is, Wonderful. We think we're the species that creates. But if you have a forest and there's a wolf in there, yes. it does a tremendous amount for holding the whole forest together and the health of it. Like right. all the species. Yes. Have, and if you kill off all the elephants or all, and you think it's the same world, it's not. Yes. And, and uh, it's, we're all doing. The yes. Humans are creating this world. Yeah, we're all so we're all interconnected all the, in this. The other creatures, yeah. Right. So that that's a good point. Um, there's just so much, and I, I know I have to get through this here. I've probably got 50 slides. We're on slide 13, but I'm just going to push through this. One of the things I want to talk about is my, one of my favorite uh, realizations of Carl Jung was what he called the synchronicity, the eight causal connecting principle. So basically, he's saying when unconscious issues aren't made conscious, so in other words, if we're ignoring some part of our unconscious, um, if, as long as we do that, uh, the universe... The outside world, as he called it, will conspire to bring those things to our attention through, uh, through fate or synchronicity, as you, would, as you would call it. So there is a whole study, and it's not just young, it's so many people who have studied the physics of synchronicity showing us that when there's something that wants to be brought to our attention, then all kinds of coincidences will happen in order to bring it to our attention. And that's part of the higher conspiracy. Other people have said that's our future self that's connecting with us. And of course, that's true too, and you can think of it that way. <coughs> oh, isn't that like karma? Like if you don't pay attention to what you're supposed to, the lesson you're supposed to learn. Right. You don't, if you don't get it the first time, the next time you have, it will be more difficult. That's right. The third time will be the running car. Right, the third time will be the running car. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I probably had two other, uh, you know, well, synchronicities before that. Right? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. Absolutely. Well, yeah, but a lot of us don't realize we're here for spiritual growth. And most people, so they, most people ignore their lessons and they keep repeating right. it over and over again. Right. So like Eckhart Tolle, he said, um, I like what relates to what you're saying is that suffering is necessary until you realize it's no longer necessary. <laughs> so like if you're going to keep ignoring like what the blessings want to give you, there's a blessing. Oh, I'm not going to take it. I'm going to ignore it. As long as you keep ignoring that, it, the blessing may have to come to you like a smack. Right. And even that doesn't have to be bad. It's what we label it. Like anything, any event can be rephrased as beautiful or positive or loving or healing. Dan, of course, has a line that says, trials are but lessons we failed to learn the first time around. Oh, trials are but lessons we failed to learn the first time around. Okay. And that's yeah. its whole discussion on collapsing time. On collapsing time, yeah. yes. So collapsing time is a big part of the, what, the ability that we have to collapse time through, through many different ways, through peace, through love, through changing our minds. And so that collapse of, the t of time also brings instantaneous synchronicities to us all the time. So that we're riding on what was called in the ancient time, the Isle of Silk or the Silk Road, which is the, was the New Age call it fourth density or fifth dimension, where um, we're constantly having synchronicity, we're constantly being blessed. So we're in that new reality, which is a, a, another conspiracy of like the universe is tr constantly trying to bring you uh, blessings, as the uh, pronoia phrase says. Pronoia is, is the new idea that um, the whole world the whole world is, is what conspiring is it? to shower you with blessings. The whole world is conspiring to shower you with blessings. <laughs> so that's actually more along. That's much closer to truth than the other conspiracy that the world is against you and that you're a victim. Mm -hmm. But that is part of the purgatory that I want to emphasize. Is that that's the, one of the most tricky things to get out of. It's the hell that you create, that we create, is that I'm a victim, you know, I'm being controlled, uh, I don't have any power, why is, why is there so many billionaires taking all the money and I can't even make any money? 
Um, so there's all these stories that we have that feed the pyramid of power that's not ultimately true, and I'll get into that. And I'm just going to go through and just see if we can get through some of these slides. I wanted to do this in a linear way, but it doesn't always work that way. Right? <laughs> uh, okay, so non-dualistic time. We do see non-dualistic time phenomenon in plants, uh, animals, and humans uh, through ESP experiments, through uh, both Harvard, Princeton have done experiments showing us that we are aware of the future. And that's the other dimension of time. And when we learn about how we can map that, we realize that we're in control. We're not a victim. Um, so we have uh, certain beings on the planet have apparently been able to bilocate, shift. This is a whole other thing we probably don't need to get into, but it allows for the human potential, show us what human potential we have. So, now, here's a couple of things I want to talk about, but I'm probably not going to get into any of those, but does, anybody, does everybody know what these acronyms stand for? LSD, your death experience. Okay. Out-of-body experiences, controlled remote viewing, dimethyltryptamine. So I only wanted to talk about the first three, near-death experience, controlled remote viewing, out-of-body experience, because they're showing us our potential. Really, that's all I want, why I want to talk about them. So does DMT and LSD. All these can be gateways, doors, to help understand our potential so that we can no longer be victims. Can I add something? You can if add you something. Look yeah. at ancient cultures who, <clears throat> and current cultures who practice shamanism. Yes. That's exactly what happens. Like right. being able to shape shift, embody right. different animals. That's right. Yes. Um, astral travel. Astral travel. Yes, so and that's a are, natural part of a lot of ancient yeah. cultures. Yeah. Okay. That's right. And and what our Western culture is forgotten, and we feel so little because we don't always have the ability to leave our body to get a greater vision. We don't always have. Well, and part of that is that their mm -hmm. their creation story Great. doesn't involve a fall, right. doesn't involve mm -hmm. a, a loss. They they're still in the, they're still in paradise. Mm -hmm. sin. Right. You know, that's no, right. No a lot of yeah. creation myths have never talked about the fall of the garden, even because that no. never even it came into their no, reality. Never Everything is already perfect. Well, maybe. we became a, uh, we became a victim of our limited belief system. If the belief system is narrow, yes. our world will be narrow. Yes, absolutely. So we can change our belief system and then the universe will change mm -hmm. correlating to that. Yes. That? Yes. I, something that to me always seems so important. Yes. And that's our children. Yes. If we raise our children where they don't experience wars and genocides and, you know, sexual abuse and all the rest of it, because that's where victims really get cemented in. Yes. And everything around them proves that, that it's true. You right. Know, that, that it's, that's not a safe world. It's not right. Safe. And children right. carry this sometimes to their... They, very they, often they're dying. Absolutely, later. they do. And that's exactly why we need to reinterpret the events. And that's why our news doesn't do a good job at being phenomenological. The news isn't saying, oh, there's this war because there's a karmic uh, unspoken love that hasn't been healed. We don't hear the news like that. <laughs> you know, but the news could be completely different news. Like in 20 years, maybe our news is all going to be about all the ways that we can respond with love, how everything is a call for love. And if the children learn that the reason these things are happening is because there's unhealed wounds that haven't been healed, instead of that the world is dangerous. So it's not that we have to block them from all of that. It's that we have to help them reinterpret what it means. I think that's a different way of saying it. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a beautiful okay. response. Shimmers. Um, I was I wrote here uh, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> in other words, we're responsible for the reality we observe. We're complicit in it, so that we can't just pretend that we're victims. And that's a uh, denial is like, ah, oh, the Illuminati is controlling everything. And didn't you see that we're under control and our minds are being controlled? Well. That could be real if you give that enough energy. Um, and there's a lot to say about that. Now, causation and karma. Um, this guy said, the law of karma is the law of causation. It, so that's, that's one quote. Uh, the law of karma is the law of causation. I, I don't know if I agree with that. But it's very interesting. <laughs> what do you, well, you mean? Do what do you mean? Back on you? Well, what do I mean that I don't understand it? Yeah. Well, it's just, it's just that... Like, like, I don't right. know. The, the, well, that's maybe maybe true. Am I understanding what? 
what he's saying. The only issue I have with that is that that's love, that like that's bait for the ego. The ego's like, oh, right on, you know, that's your because people do this all the time where they're like, oh, it's karma. They people think that they understand what karma is, and so they're and they're using that as a judgment tool, saying, oh, that's bad karma. This karma. This karma. Okay, well, then what is it? Uh, so then, what is what? Karma is karma. Well, I think I think karma is is an, an immediately uh, reaction. It's, it is like cause and effect. I don't, I don't know how I would describe karma, but it's just like a response from the universe to an action. And the way we interpret karma is what I'm getting at, is it often can be misinterpreted. It can be misinterpreted, but yeah. It's like, and that's a big misinterpretation. It's like a, a, a pendulum swing. Yeah. And there's nothing, ego can't figure it out, because ego's so busy around ego that it's all got to do with that. But you're yes. just talking about the... Sure. Energy of the universe. Yeah. What you put out, you get. Yeah, that's out. ultimately right. Yeah. Michael. Well, I'm just thinking in terms of uh, the message that when we're ignoring the message and what can happen uh, and how that can get bigger. Yes. Uh, is that not karma in a way? Yes. You know, and wow. and I was thinking about what you said around what's real and what's not real and how we do things collectively and make it. Yes. We you know we agree money, you know we money is. We, we made it up. And then we yes. all agreed on what it is, and there's all these institutions yes. about what yes. it is right. and how it works, and we're all tied in with it. Yes. And no. it's made up. Yes. Right. And yet we're stuck in it somehow. Right. And, but the big thing is, yes. like even right now when we think about profits having been valued over the planet, Yes. and the planet has given us a, the lesson, you've got it wrong here, people because you're not going to have a planet if we continue That's to right. go for profits. That's right. Fossil well, fuel maybe we're different. in an age. Maybe we're in the age of materialism. Well, I, I guess my point is that we can collectively get messages, too. We can. You know, we, a lot of this, this is There's collective stuff. messages. There's collective yeah. karma. There's collective yeah. cause and effect. Yeah. The environment is a good example. Uh, this guy says, as for the law of moral causation, he used karma in quotes, this is human justice dressed up as cosmic justice, and then imputed to the impersonal workings of the natural world. That's interesting. But that's kind of more along the lines of what I was saying. Now I want to get through this quick. Purgatory realms. So there's a lot in Tibetan, um, Tibetan Buddhism about the realms of the hungry ghosts and the human realms. And the samsara wheel, as long as we're in duality, we're riding this wheel of suffering, which is uh, purgatory. So the idea is to transcend that duality. Now, I'm gonna, I have two more points here, and one of them is the, the fear-based conspiracy theories. Uh, if we put too much invested energy into the idea that we're victim, then we make the pyramid real, the pyramid of power. In other words, we don't get the message, and I think this is our pyramid of power. We created it. It will be a pyramid of power that will effectively control you as a victim as long as you're not aware of your complicitness in that pyramid realizing that you don't have to be in it. Um, now, I use this as a really interesting analogy. Alex Jones, David Icke, Michael Tessarion, and Jordan Maxwell work for the CIA. Now, I don't know if anybody, does anybody know who that these people I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, and the reason that I say that they work for the CIA is because by analogy, my vibe that I get from a gut reaction is that their message, many of their messages may have been love-based, but over time, the, uh, these are just examples of people who I feel fallen into a kind of a dark, um, fear-based energy realm. In other words, being the victim, not reminding people that we are powerful. Instead, that we're a victim. And I'm only saying they work for the CIA by analogy. Alex Jones was an amazing whistleblower, but now he does the very things that he's against. So j just with his, the way he uh, uses energy um, and creates fear. There's a wake up. So what I'm saying is the p purpose of the red pill, going down the rabbit hole, is, is a wake up. The purpose of the red pill is to wake up to your potential, to your self-empowerment. What 9-11 in numerology means new beginnings. The 9-11 is an inside job, is for us to look at our shadow, which needs attention and healing. That's the whole point. And the, the fire chief who was the first responder to the 9-11, it went in and saw bombs going off underneath the towers. 
he was furious. He was all over the radio saying this was an inside job. That person, and I had a, years ago, I, I played a video of him, and he said, I'm not worried. I realize now, it's I'm no longer angry. I realize there's a need for love. And he had a spiritual awakening saying, clearly, Dick Cheney and all these people are, are shadow figures representing a need for love, deep, deep need for love in their world. And so the 9-11 is meant to be a wake-up to bring healing and love. So that's, that's the way I'm going to say that's what the conspiracy theory is for. So there's victimhood, there's responsibility, and there's, you can be in, empowered as well with these events. So the final point is uh, the shift into peace. So really, pronoia is the real conspiracy. If, we're, if we take that conspiratorial breath, we'll realize there is a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy to bring us back into our hearts, into love, into, this, into a higher synchronicity of peace and forgiveness. And so, pronoia. Um, now, what does that say? Okay, can you guys read that? No. 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 It is defined as the opposite state of mind to paranoia. Having the sense that there is a conspiracy that exists to help the person. It is also used to describe a philosophy that the world is set up to secretly benefit people. Yeah. <laughs> pronoia. We should all get involved. Yes. Well, you're pronoia. <laughs> you're pronoia. Pronoia. <laughs> so if you're paranoid, there's a medicine for that. It's called pronoia. Pronoia. <laughs> Everything you need will come to you at the perfect time. So raising your vibrations. So the part of the wake up into peace from purgatory is. Music, meditation, vibration, choosing differently, forgiveness, being phenomenological, like at least don't be so quick to judge, but it's like, yeah, that's very interesting. Be phenomenological, it doesn't, it can be neutral and it can allow it to transform into a, an amazing message. Love, prayer, these art. are all solutions. You forgot art. Oh, art. Like, you know, this list can go on and on, but yes, art. We have to put, that's what that space is for right there. <laughs> That's what. That's why I love that space. Well, you can see it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I see it. I just got yeah. an empty palette here, right? <laughs> so there's a lot to remind us of the real universal laws of love, and it's all over. Like all these ancient cultures have been telling us about that for years, and uh, so that's that's what I. That's my conclusion. We're all about love. <laughs> Choose love, not fear. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Can we go back to the first slide just so, I don't know, I wanted to read that. The, the very first slide? Yeah, the very one. The, like, Buddhism was at the top. Oh, yeah, okay. 